Okay, so this is the panel of um, genetically engineered organisms. We have uh, three speakers, and I'm just going to give them you know, brief introductions to them now, and then we'll come up one at a time, speak for 15 to 20 minutes, and then we'll have each, and we will have some tap uh, questions. So our first speaker will be Jack Kittridge, who's the policy director for one of these Organic Film Association in Massachusetts. And then we'll be followed by Bill Fries, who's a science policy analyst for the Center for Food Safety in Washington. And then Paul Dittgen from, uh, from Public Employees for Environmental Responsibility and on the Downtown Society Board. So I'll just let you take it All right, well, thank you. Um, before I begin, I brought some copies of our newspaper, the newspaper Natural Farmers, up, so up here and some back here. And this issue is on transgenic crops, so you're welcome to people. Um, uh, I'm Paul So My name is Jack Kittredge. I'm the policy director for NOFA, Massachusetts. NOFA has seven chapters in the Northeast, and Massachusetts is, is uh, one of them. We won the NOFA Summer Conference, which you may have heard about, big gathering about 14, 1,500 people every summer in Amherst, Massachusetts. And uh, we have joined with the other NOFAs in this uh, lawsuit against Monsanto. So we're very active right now on the transgenic issue. We're bringing Jeffrey Smith to our conference in August in Amherst to run a training for people who are interested in organizing against GMOs in their neighborhoods and <coughs> so forth. So um, if anybody's interested in that stuff, I'd be glad to talk more about it. Uh, I was going to do just a basic introduction into the GMOs. I assume most of you are fairly uh, fluent with them, but I want to make sure of that. And um, just I, I have a small PowerPoint that talks a little bit about the history and, and some of the dangers and concerns. Can everybody hear me all right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. okay. Um, so I guess I'll just start right with that. Um, And they are substantially equivalent to what's already out there, a, a 
tomato as nature made it and a tomato as Calgene made it, you know, they look the same, so they're substantially equivalent, so therefore they don't need any regulation. Um, <clears throat> and the FDO, uh, FDA as a statement of policy said that we're not aware of any information that these foods are different from their natural uh, uh, counterparts and therefore we are not going to regulate them uh, in any new way. However, a number of FDA documents you know, confirmed that the science involved in, in the FDA were very upset by these decisions. Um, <clears throat> here's some of the quotes from scientists at the time who were rebelling against their political uh, uh, losses. Um, some of these issues were very serious, they felt, needed research and needed um, further testing, and they <clears throat> felt it was dangerous to go forward without any of that. Allergens, toxins, new diseases, nutritional problems, all these things were potentially out there. And as we will see, these have emerged now <clears throat> in the 20 years that these, these crops have been out of the market. Um, antibiotic resistance, clearly a major problem. Uh, antibiotic resistance has to be engineered into every GMO crop as part of the process of transferring the, the DNA. Um, but the science were overruled by the political bosses. Um, <clears throat> Michael Taylor, you may have heard of him, he's now the food safety czar in the Obama administration. He has been back and forth between the FDA and Monsanto for a number of years in different positions of responsibility. He's an example of the you know, revolving door syndrome between biotech and <clears throat> the federal government. Um, here's a <clears throat> FDA letter to Monsanto. I just want to highlight this last phrase here. Um, the FDA is saying it is Monsanto's responsibility to ensure that foods marketed by the firm are safe. However, Monsanto's position <coughs> is quite a bit different. According to Phil Ainge, Monsanto's corporate communications director, Monsanto should not have to vouch for the safety of biotech food. Our interest is in selling as much as possible, assuring its safety is mm -hmm. FDA's job. So you've got this kind of a sharing of responsibility on both parts, and it's still neither side is taking any serious responsibility for doing independent testing or review. The primary traits that have been engineered, despite the wonderful things you hear about uh, golden rice and vaccine laden bananas and so forth, the only two that are really out there at all are herbicide tolerance, which is Roundup Ready, essentially. All the new ones are now coming on the market. And pesticide production, which is Bacillus thuringiensis. And those have been engineered into the four major crops and there are <coughs> a number of crops in the pipeline coming along with, uh, with those as well. Uh, now alfalfa, sugar beets are, are out there. Uh, does biotech raise yields? Study after study says no. You know, you hear them say, oh, well, biotech's going to feed the world. Genetic engineering's going to feed the world. The assumption is somehow this is going to increase yields. It's not going to increase yields. Look at the studies. They show it does not increase yields. Does it taste better? Animal studies have shown consistently that animals refuse to eat it when they have an option. Um, is it healthy? Here's some studies that, you know, they're primarily European, um, and these primarily animal studies, which is what we call what we have, but they're pretty serious and scary stuff. With, with rats, a number of them develop stomach lesions after a few days, and within two weeks, seven out of 40 died. Um, lesions in um, intestines, gut, stomach, uh, internal organs, uh, liver are very, are very uh, most common symptoms. GM potatoes, um, they were out for a while, the new leaf potato, and later got, got came off the market because nobody was buying it. But um, <clears throat> serious number of, of health impacts on animals from eating GM potatoes. Um, BT toxin, this is a natural toxin that is present in soil microorganisms and has been extracted from them and inserted into every cell of these plants so that they constantly emit the small toxin. And what it does is it, it uh, essentially poisons and kills a very specific narrow range of insects at the larval stage. And um, they have different BTs for different insects. So they see this as a very precise way to, work, to go after um, potato bugs or leaf hoppers or uh, a number of individual, uh, individual bugs at the larval stage. Um, however, what they didn't realize, and, and we're only now beginning to understand, is that <coughs> BT survives digestion. That is, if you eat a BT, you know, here, 
corn, sweet corn or something, that Bt is going to be active in your stomach. And that has been found consistently now. And the problem with that is that that Bt, if it kills microorganisms and kill, it's a toxin, is it gonna, what's it, its impact going to be on some of the organisms in your digestive tract that you're, that you're counting on to eat your food and digest your food and build your immune system? Um, studies with animals have been very, have raised a number of concerns. In uh, India, they have uh, fed, after they, they have a BT cotton that's prevalent in India as it is in this country. Uh, once they harvest the cotton, they turn the animals loose in India into the fields to eat the stalks and so forth and the rest of the residue. And <clears throat> sheep, you know, grazing on BT cotton <laughs> have experienced serious um, mortality. Um, then you've got Bogard, Bogard 2, and non GMO. Bogard and Bogard 2 are two different varieties of BT toxin. Um, <clears throat> and the GM groups had 100% mortality within 25 to 30 days. Um, same thing with buffalo. Um, they were turned loose and had a number of deaths very rapidly. Holes in the lungs, liver, darker, <clears throat> flattened. Undigested food in the rumen. One of the suggestions is that BT toxin somehow kills the bacteria in the rumen, which are vital to ruminants being able to digest it, obviously. And so you, got, you have a whole fermentation process that happens without the ultimate digestion, and it goes up and actually can be a, you know, can be a small explosion in the, the gases in the, in the stomach of the rumen. Uh, not pleasant stuff. Um, Lice fed GM soy, um, pancreas problems, altered gene expression, cell structure. Rabbits found fed around up ready soy, um, changed enzyme levels in kidneys, hearts, and livers. Uh, mice fed GM soy uh, have liver problems, higher metabolic activity, suggesting some kind of toxic insult. Um, <clears throat> there's control on the left, non GM soy on the right, which is yellow, and the GM soy is the green. 50% deaths of baby rats at a Russian lab. That Russian lab later, as a matter of course, changed its you know, feed supply to all GM. So when they did that, infant mortality for all the rats was 55%. Basically, these are scary things. Nobody's investigating this stuff. We are eating it, Americans are eating it commonly as part of our diet. Is this something we need to deal with? The American Academy of Environmental concludes that animal studies indicate serious health risks. Infertility, immune dysregulation of cellular aging, dysregulation of genes, uh, insulin regulation, cell signaling, protein formation, changes in liver, kidney, spleen, and gastrointestinal system. But these are not things that need to be researched and studied, and we need the option not to eat. Um, I don't know what, what can be more important in you know, our health. Um, we have made mistakes like this before in the past. Um, you know, some people can remember the DDT was not raised by people in backyards and children playing in the farm and it was not considered a hazard at all. So with other than gasoline, PCBs, I would contend that GMOs basically are another example of this unregulated um, science that we have released into the marketplace and we need, we need to call it back. Nobody has really, uh, in, in position of responsibility, has taken that, that job on. The administration has not taken it on. They've, they've continued to release things. Uh, nobody in the legislative house, either the federal or the state level so far, although there's some promising science here in Connecticut, um, has taken the, even the move towards labeling, and the courts have not moved in our favor. They've done, done some delays, but, but not <clears throat> stopping this technology. Um, Here's just a, a chart of the various average health care spending per capita in a number of industrialized nations. You notice how the U.S. has risen consistently since about 1984, 85. Um, <clears throat> who knows? Could be a lot of reasons behind that. I would just suggest that maybe GMOs are one of the reasons that we have space of allergies and other kinds of uh, issues in our hospitals that we don't even understand why we have them. Um, so now we've got no post-market surveillance, no human clinical trials, no proper evaluation of changes or effects, approvals based on disproved, untested assumptions, 
and industry studies that are associated with the data. Monsanto, they want to grow, we basically own and patent all the food that's grown. And so we can't eat anything unless it's you know, by their lead. Um, as farmers, we are very concerned about that because we obviously don't want to have to license our plants or our crops. We want to be able to save our seed and replant. We are worried about contamination of the good things that are out there. There are people who have grown organic strains of corn for years whose corn is now testing out contaminated from pollen from neighboring GMO corn. We have entered into that the lawsuit as, as part of that, but we need further protection. Um, corn pollen is viable for about six hours. How far can bees, wind, and trucks move in six hours to bring that corn from somewhere miles away to contaminate your field? Um, some organic crops are now showing trace amounts of GMO contamination. Um, seed suppliers will often not guarantee their sales for their seed free of GMOs. And the USDA is now considering requiring expensive GMO testing for some organic production. How do we stop this? Well, just label it. You know, over a million people have now supported the labeling campaign uh, at the FDA. Um, <clears throat> the FDA has complete authority to do this on their own. It doesn't require any new legislation. We just need to give them the political will to do it. Um, to avoid GMOs in the marketplace, there are non-GMO shopping guides out there. There's now a uh, label you can get that says uh, one numbers of foods that are adopting a non-GMO verified system to mark and label the food. Um, unfortunately, animal products still cannot be tested for GMOs because the, most of the GMOs disappear in the processing to make them milk and meat. So <clears throat> unless you buy it as an organic animal product, <coughs> that animal almost certainly has been fit GMOs in its, in its lifetime, the chicken or the cow. Um, so, here's some of the foods that contain GMOs. Uh, here's a non-GMO shop guide. But the best way to do it is to grow your own food. So we encourage you to have your own <coughs> garden, you know, shop, to shop at farmers markets, to buy locally, and to eat raw, and eat basic ingredients rather than buy things at the stores that have been, you know, processed, because that's where you'll find most of this. So, thank you very much. <coughs>
used to mechanize. Um, most GMOs are soybeans and corn uh, with a little less cotton and canola. Of course, that's mostly, they're mostly used for animal feeds or for uh, ethanol production in the case of corn. And what I'm really going to talk, kind of focus in on this talk, is the traits. And, and Jack kind of mentioned this, but basically, two traits herbicide resistance or insect resistance. And in fact, herbicide resistance is found in five of every six acres of biotech crops for the whole life, right? So this is the technology for the industry, basically. Um, so what are these crops, herbicide resistance? It, it's basically a modification that allows the farmer to apply the herbicide directly to the crop to kill weeds that are growing nearby. And so what it does is it kind of frees the farmer from having to worry about hurting the crop when he applies his herbicides, right? Because a lot of herbicides will kill more also the crop. So this, you know, it, it tends to simplify weed control and save labor. It doesn't increase yield at all. This is all. And, and almost all of them, as Jack said, are round and ready for glyphosate resistant glyphosate. the active ingredient in Roundup, uh, soybeans, corn, cotton, canola. Um, and what's happened is with the enormous adoption of these round and ready crops, there's been near total reliance on the surface side. So there's been a huge epidemic of weeds that become resistant to glyphosate around it. And it's the same principle by which uh, bacteria evolve resistance and antibiotics, natural selection. You throw enough of something at a living organism, and you're going to select for those, those rare ones that have resistance. And pretty soon, those are going to take over the population. Okay, it doesn't involve gene flow, right? It's just the massive use of Roundup has caused this Probably, probably 15 million acres of cropland or probably more are infested with these life savers and weeds. And uh, you know, it's expected to continue to rise dramatically in the coming years. Um, so this is, this is a really big deal. Oops. No, no. Oh shit, we actually got the wrong thing. Hold on. Um, yeah, so one response of farmers with these resistant weeds is to their use of herbicides because sometimes you can still kill the weeds if you up the dose of glyphosate or they add in other herbicides like 248. So this is a study by Chuck Benbrook, the organic center showing and it gives, gives you an idea that 383 million more pounds of herbicide have been used in the 13 years of GMO cultivation over this period uh, that would have been used without these herbicide resistant products. And part of this is due to the weed response to that Now, this, uh, this slide is, is pretty interesting. You think here that the crop, that this would be the crop, right? But in fact, no, this is the crop. These are soybean plants. And this is glyphosate-resistant horse wheat, which is like one of the worst of the glyphosate-resistant weeds. This field has been sprayed with Roundup. But obviously, the horse wheat doesn't really care too much. It's doing much better than the soybeans. This is, yeah, the most prevalent I'd like to say this is going to be, it's in about, I don't know, 15 or 20 states on millions of acres. This is a cotton field, um, either Arkansas or Georgia, I believe. This is cotton, and this is cotton that's infested with glyphosate resistant pigment. Um, so what's been happening in cotton fields and also in soybeans is there's a huge increase in the use of weeding crews. Guys going out there with hoes, all right? In Georgia, half a million acres weeded by hand in 2009, half a million acres of cotton uh, because of this glyphosate resistant weed is so bad and so difficult to control. I mean, it's like literally, you know, kind of going to the past of weed control thanks to uh, the latest in ag technology. And this is glyphosate resistant Johnson grass in Argentina. Uh, we also have that in the States. And it's, it's really bad in, in Argentina where they grow almost all of the soybeans are around. Um, just some quotes, you know, showing the, the degree of concern in mainstream ag circles about these resistant weeds. Um, one thing is, one response of farmers besides applying more pesticides is to use more tillage, to till more, to remove the weeds, and that, and that has a lot of people who are committed to no-till or conservation tillage upset because it needs more soil erosion. Um, 
they're, they're, that's a whole new game that you know you can get into. But in any case, there's, there's, this is really a, a mainstream concern. Um, this is the title of a Wall Street Journal article from 2010 that I think really kind of hits the nail on the head. The latest response to these life savers and seaweeds by the biotech companies is to develop a whole host of new crops that are resistant to other herbicides. All right? So you can't kill your roundup resistant seaweeds with roundup. So guess what? We've got we're developing a whole host of new crops here for the farmers. And you know, I think it's it's an interesting how bald they are about it. The Dow scientists is just crowing about this. You know, great new opportunity to sell a lot more pesticides. Uh, and again, this is Wall Street Journal, so this guy was, you know, understands who he's talking to, business readers, um, the New York Times. These are a couple of the crops that are being developed, 2,4-D resistant, dicamba resistant. These are, you know, all older herbicides and more toxic, generally considered significantly more toxic than they would like to say. Um, and this is kind of where we're headed now with, with biotech. This is um, the increase in herbicide use that's being projected in a recent paper that came out, David Morton says, at Penn State, we have called with the introduction of 240 and dicamba resistant soybeans. And the blue line represents kind of the amount of glyphosate uh, per acre that's presently being used on, on soybeans in the United States. And you can see, you know, these other herbicides, 240 and dicamba means other herbicides here, are very little used on soybeans right now. But once the resistant versions are introduced, and that could come in the next several years, he foresees a huge increase anywhere from here to here in 2,4-D and dicamba use for overall herbicide use uh, represented by the black lines, depending on the rates the farmers use. So, so you can see we're, we're talking about a really significant you know, increase in, in use of toxic uh, herbicides because of, uh, because of the industry's uh, strategy. And that's just near term. In the longer term, the industry has genes that confer resistance to all these different herbicides. But what I find really interesting is all of these, these are all herbicides, right? And the genes for resistance to these herbicides almost all come from soil bacteria. And I think it's pretty clear that the bacteria have evolved resistance through the use of these herbicides in, you know, over the past decades. And so now the you know the scientists, the companies are exploiting that. They're going to take the genes that have evolved through past use of these herbicides, put them in the plants, and thus enable greatly expand the use of those same herbicides. Alright, so that's kind of the strategy going forward. And again, a lot of these crops are going to be resistant to three and four herbicides each. So that companies will introduce herbicide mixes, right? So farmers can easily apply multiple chemicals at once to their crops. Um, I think if you look at the industry, it's becoming clear, you know, it becomes clear why you're interested in this. These are all, of course, pesticide companies, Monsanto, DuPont, Syngenta, uh, are, you know, long been pesticide and agrochemical companies. And then in the 80s and 90s, they started to buy up uh, most of the big seed companies in the United States and around the world. And we christened themselves biotechnology companies. A lot of times, I just call them pesticide companies, because of course, they're still very heavily into to pesticides. Um, and a lot of people don't realize that in agriculture, herbicides rule. They're like almost they're right around two thirds of all agricultural pesticide use is herbicides, and it's way more than, for instance, than insecticides, which we tend to hear a lot more about. So, you know, clearly, companies have real interest in promoting use of these chemicals. So, just briefly, what we're doing, what we're trying to do about this. Well, we have a number of different activities, um, and I think I'm going to focus in on our lawsuits. Um, we, the, one of the more recent round of ready crops is alfalfa, and we sued the USDA for illegally approving it in 2005. And you know, basically, US, USDA is supposed to do an environmental assessment uh, before approving a crop, before it can be grown commercially. USDA has to give its approval. They're the main regulator here, 
And uh, we, the judge agreed with us that USDA did not do its job and actually reversed the approval of Roundup Ready Alfalfa until the USDA conducted a more extensive environmental impact statement as it's called. Uh, so for about four years, new planting of Roundup Ready Alfalfa was, was prohibited. Which so it was a significant victory. Unfortunately, USDA did that assessment, that longer assessment, which in our view was just as flawed as the original one, but a lot longer. Um, and then it was reapproved in 2011, and we're currently challenging that decision. So it's, you know, we are still fighting the round of dirty up alpha, which is, you know, really is, has a lot of people concerned. Uh, it's grown up. Alfalfa's grown on about 20 million acres. Of course, it's really important for dairy farmers. And, uh, we also sued USDA on round of sugar beets, and very similar. The, the court, you know, uh, agreed with us. We, uh, and round of sugar beets were their approval was reversed until a more extensive assessment was conducted. Uh, here too, the, the crop was was reapproved uh, in 2011. Now, some of the issues in the lawsuits, Jack mentioned contamination issues. That's, of course, where you get pollen or seed from the crop, which gets into conventional organic crops. And that can have real huge consequences for organic conventional, or conventional farmers. And in fact, in both of those cases, we had co-plaintiffs who were either farmers, some of them conventional farmers, or seed companies, small seed companies, um, and both organic and conventional. So, you know, the one of the, the one of the issues that the original rulings emphasized was that, you know, contamination is actually an environmental impact. You, you change the, the DNA of a plant, and it has that kind of consequences, and so that needs to be taken into account. So we're still fighting to get this principle, you know, acknowledged in law. Uh, and then some of the other issues were increased glyphosate use and its environmental impacts and uh, increased prevalence of glyphosate resistant weeds. USDA has authority over not what are called noxious weeds. Um, and you know it's clear that some of these glyphosate resistant weeds are clearly causing like, such huge headaches for farmers that you could kind of rise to that level. Um, USDA's position on the other hand is we don't have the authority to do anything. Um, Accept, approve these round of great crops, and we don't even have the authority to set conditions on, on approval when we approve them to prevent contamination or weed resistance. <coughs> um, the bottom line is they, they really are just they're, they're interpreting their legal status uh, so narrowly that they're just throwing up their hands and saying we can't do anything but approve these crops, and we think that's totally mistaken. You know, take on the law. Uh, it just so happened to USDA's general counsel, their top lawyer, that came from DuPont, one of the major biotech companies, so maybe it's not surprising. Um, yeah, we believe USDA has broad authority in the Plant Protection Act to protect the interests of American agriculture. Um, and there's, you know, USDA should also be consulting with Fish and Wildlife Service and other federal agencies uh, because of good evidence that ground that excessive use of ground that can damage uh, endangered species of the habitats. And then finally, as I said, USDA does have authority over noxious weeds and so could take action. One final thing we're doing, Jack also mentioned this, we're involved in the Just Label it campaign. Um, this was a petition that, that we helped write in October 2001. And just in just a few months since then, uh, we, we have one million public comments uh, in support of you know, mandatory labeling of genetically engineered food. So I think this is really, I mean, I'm, I'm frankly surprised we've had this huge support. I think it's a real, real uh, good opportunity for a lot of people to get involved mm -hmm. uh, in this issue supporting the uh, labeling campaign. Um, so, yeah, I um, thank you for listening. And
genetically modified crops on national wildlife refuges. And um, this is kind of a narrow area in terms of you know, the amount of acreage compared to what they were talking about, but it gives us kind of a view of what the government um, involvement in promotion of genetically modified crops is and what the attitude is and how we challenge that. So our um, organization, the way we work is um, that everything we do comes to us from a public employee who can be at any level of government, who um, is an environmental professional and is coming to us and saying, you know, something is going wrong in the way that I am where I work is implementing the law or managing our land or something like that. And so the way we got involved in this is that we were approached by a biologist who worked in the Prime Book National Wildlife Refuge in Delaware, as well as somebody from the state environmental agency. And they came to us because they were outraged about something that had happened. Um, National Wildlife Refuges have traditionally allowed some land to be used for farming. Um, and they have these cooperative agreements with farmers where farmers will grow their crop on a certain amount of acreage and they don't have to pay to use that land, but they leave some of the crops the way most of these agreements work. They leave some of the crop for most of the migratory birds to eat. Now the whole practice of farming on refugees is really questionable. Um, and we believe that it's done you know, mainly just to sort of placate the neighbors who are farmers, but they're getting something out of having this land be in, in federal um, management. Um, I mean, for one thing, you know, migratory birds and other wildlife don't normally eat soybeans. You know, they may, may be a little more corn, but definitely not soybeans. And the other thing is that these refuges, for the most part, are surrounded by farmland. So why would you need a refuge um, if you want to, you know, have more farming to supposedly help the wildlife. But in any event, this has been going on for a long time, and in Prime Hope, there's about 10,000 acres in the refuge, and about 500 were used for farming. And um, at one point, the refuge management got some money, they got about $200,000 to do an experiment. And that was that they were going to take uh, three areas of 50 acres each and convert them back from farming to natural grasses and native plants and study, you know, how fast that could be done, how successfully could it be done, and what was the impact on wildlife. So they did this three-year study and they were, they found, you know, that it went back to a native plant community even faster than they had hoped. Um, it became, these 350 acre areas became great areas for wildlife viewing, you know, birders were sending on them. Um, it was just an incredibly successful project. And it showed, you know, what we sort of suspected, which is that native plant communities are much better for wildlife than growing corn or soybeans. And, um, but unfortunately, the wildlife refuge manager got an order, and this came from the Assistant Secretary of Interior, you know, the number two level in the whole Department of Interior, um, to plow up this land that they just spent $200,000 studying and returning to native grasses and replant it with genetically modified corn. Um, and so, you know, why such high level interest in this 150 acres of Delaware? Um, and I'll get back to that. Um, I'll <coughs> discover that. But um, meanwhile, we um, decided to bring suit against this because they had, they were allowing genetically modified crops to be grown on this refuge without having done any environmental assessment under the National Environmental Policy Act or what's called a compatibility determination, which is something that's required under the National Wildlife Refuge Administration Act, where any economic activity on a refuge, you have to, the, the refuge manager has to show how it is compatible with the purposes of the refuge, which are the wildlife. And they hadn't done either of these things. So um, I, we, we were doing some publicity on this, and I guess Senator for Food Safety Bills heard about it, and they said they wanted to join us in this challenge. 
and we also um, brought it with the um, Delaware Audubon Society. It so happened that the, one of the employees who came to us about this problem left the government and went to the Delaware Audubon Society. <laughs> so they were brought along on the suit. So shortly after we filed the suit, which was really a slam dunk because they hadn't done any of the studies that they're required to do under these laws, um, the government said that they would like to sell this. And you know, they proposed a settlement where they would not do any further planting of genetically modified crops on the refuge until they had done the proper environmental studies. And so we thought, well, that sounds good. You know, that's what we wanted to win in our relief we were asking for, so if they're willing to give us the settlement, fine. Um, but we were a little naive, and we let them go for you know many months, crossing the I's and dotting the T's in the settlement, until they told us, no, nah, we don't want to settle after all. You know, or basically, they, they said they were going to put a provision in the settlement that they knew would be unacceptable and that we couldn't agree to. And then after they said, no, we're not going to settle after all, um, they filed a motion with the court to dismiss our case as moot because they said, well, we're not doing any more farming on the refuge, not any more GMO farming on the refuge, um, so therefore the case is moot. Please dismiss it. Um, and we're not going to do any more until we do the proper environmental reviews, which is basically what they had offered us to settle for. Uh, so they were trying to obviously not get a ruling on the merits in this case. Um, but we came back and said, no, the case isn't moot, you know, a case is not moot when um, a player just changes their behavior in order to avoid litigation, but they couldn't at any time go back to what they were doing before. And we won on that. The court ruled um, that the case wasn't moot, that they failed to comply with the National Environmental Policy Act and the Refuge Act, um, and they couldn't plant any more genetically modified crops. Did. So when we got this victory, we thought, oh great, you know, now we can um, stop this practice nationwide because you know one court rule we have to do this. There's no reason why it should be allowed anywhere else in the nation. So we sent a letter to every national wildlife refuge manager in the country, and there's a few hundred of them, and attached this decision and said, hey, now you know you can't grow genetically modified crops on refuge anymore unless you do, at least unless you do the proper environmental reviews and show um, that it is appropriate, an appropriate use of a refuge. And one of the things, um, couldn't use this legally because it's not legally enforceable, but the internal policy of the Fish and Wildlife Service, which runs the refuge system, is that GMOs cannot be used there unless their use is essential, not just, you know, sort of okay and not hurting it, but essential to the refuge purpose. So they were clearly going against their own policy. And, and their own policy generally is you know, that native plant communities are better than um, anything else. So we sent this letter out. We thought you know, we'd get a nationwide uh, result. We got nothing, zero result. Nobody changed. So um, we still didn't know, you know exactly why this was or where this was coming from. But we decided, well, we better go bring another suit, um, another refuge, you know, and sort of build up. So the next thing we did was um, on Bombay Hook National Refuge, which is right next door to the first one, Prime Hook, and under the same sort of umbrella of management. And we thought, well, you know, how can they, you know, be doing it right next door? We just got a decision that they can't do it um, next door to them. And so um, we brought that suit, and at, the government again said they wanted to settle, and we, we tried to get a nationwide agreement um, as part of the settlement. We couldn't get that, but they did agree that at least in the Northeast region, the refuge system is divided into regions, um, that there would be no more growing of genetically modified crops until they comply um, with these requirements to do environmental and so we figured, well, you know, that, that rather than wait, you know, several months or a year to get a court decision, you know, we'll go with the settlement for at least we get more of this region. So we did that, and um, but still, the other regions, meanwhile, we were doing a lot of Freedom Information Act requests to find out 
where these crops were being grown all over the country in different refuges and whether they had done proper environmental reviews or not all over the country. And we were finding that there was lots of it all over the country, but most of what they had done environmental reviews. Um, so we had a plan along with the Center for Food Safety, and then Beyond Pesticides also came in as a plaintiff to go region by region. Um, but meanwhile, what started happening is that they started doing environmental reviews. They started doing environmental assessments that said there was no significant impact. And um, also around this time, we found out from another biologist who worked for Fish and Wildlife Service, um, just by chance, that somebody we were working with on another subject came to us and said, you know, there's this group called the, uh, it's the White House Agricultural Biotechnology Working Group. And um, he was assigned to be on it. And they're having meetings talking about your lawsuit. So we thought, well, that was interesting. And he sent us um, a list of all the people who were on this group. And we, uh, I didn't bring this for everybody, but if you want to take a look at it later, um, this White House group, which is run by the Office of Science and Technology Policy at the White House, um, has high officials on it from the Executive Office of the President, the Office of Management and Budget, the Science and Technology Policy, the U.S. State Department, the Office of the Trade Representative, the U.S. Department of Justice, the White House Council on Environmental Quality, and the, the EPA, the, and the Department of Agriculture, Food and Drug Administration. So we're thinking, wow, did this high level group come together just to, you know, count our, our refuge suits? And we started doing some Freedom of Information Act requests to find out more about this group. And actually they've exist, they existed since the 80s. We don't know how much they did or what, but we found out what they were doing is that they, they were having all these high level people from all the major government departments environmental assessments that were being done for the different refuge regions to, you know, buck them up and make sure that they were good enough to withstand our court challenges. So, you know, why would they do this? Obviously, this is an insight into, you know, at how high a level of the Obama administration that is supporting GM. And it seems that the reason for what we could tell from our informant who was on the group um, has a lot to do with trade policy, you know, that they're trying to improve the balance of trade, and in order to get countries to accept our agricultural exports, they have to be willing to accept GM crops, because as was shown in these previous presentations, you know, we've got almost all of our corn and soybeans and so forth for GM. And so this is getting very high level attention, and even something, you know, that as relatively small as whether these crops can be grown on wildlife or wildlife refuges um, is viewed as extremely important because any um, any indication that the United States government thinks that GM crops are not just perfect and you know something we want our wildlife to be eating um, will be viewed as something that can be used in other countries or that can disparage Crops. So we've got a, a high level um, opponent here, you know, unfortunately in the Obama administration. So um, just to finish up, so now we have we have a suit going in the southeast region and one of the Midwest region. And the southeast region was uh, is a little bit easier because the environmental assessment they did was only six pages and all they did was adopt other assessments that we're talking about here just to improve the crop in general, which you know we're saying is has nothing to do with um, the, using that crop on a wildlife refuge in a particular environment, particular endangered species, etc. And um, the tactic the government has taken, the Midwest suit is just beginning to be briefed, but in the Southeast suit, um, they're taking the same tactic all over again as Pride Book and saying, claiming that they're not going to do it anymore, but they are going to do it this season because the farmers have already got their seeds. But they claim that, well, after this season, we won't do it until we do a new environmental, new better environmental assessment and the case is moved. Um, 
um, and we're briefing that right now. So that's where it stands now. The attorney, what about the fact that there are impacts, 
have been demonstrated, both ecosystem and also these lab animal studies. I, I mean, <coughs> we actually have to have a person sickened or die from GMO. You want to say something about the coordinated complaint which GMOs are supposed to be doing? So I think that may be something that speaks to the question. Well, I don't know if I'd be able to talk about that a little bit more than, than I did, but um, I'll just say something you can correct it or <laughs> supplement it. Um, because GMOs are regulated under this Plant Protection Act, mm -hmm. which really wasn't intended for GMOs or, you know, it's for plant pests, and they've sort of been shoehorned in there. And I know, you know, you were saying in your presentation that you believe that it could be interpreted much more properly to do a good job of regulating these. But it hasn't been. And so part of, you know, we've used the National Environmental Policy Act to say, well, they have to do an environmental impact statement on the impacts. And mm -hmm. that way you can look at really broad impacts, including all the impacts you're talking about. It doesn't have to be human health. Mm -hmm. But the National Environmental Policy Act doesn't force a result. You know, once you've looked at all these impacts, the court can say, well, um, you've considered them and you've decided to go ahead anyway. There's nothing to stop it under that law. And that's, I guess, the recent decision you got, you know, the negative decision that's being appealed. Um, that's basically what the judge said. Is the judge said the Plant Protection Act is very narrow. You don't have to look at genetic drift. Um, you, know, you don't have to look at a lot of these uh, at pesticide use because pesticide use is allowed by EPA and licensed by EPA under the pesticide law. It has, you know, the fact that somebody's using a crop that requires much more pesticide, um, you know, doesn't mean that that's an impact of that decision. Um, the, because the pesticide use is regulated elsewhere. And then they decided that, well, they did take, you know, what's quote unquote the hard look that you need to take under an environmental impact statement um, and just decided to kind of ignore the bad things. So um, that's sort of the, I think, the difficulty in. Um, bringing out all those issues and when you can bring them out the question is whether you get a result that actually will stop the use of these crops. Thank you. Yeah, it, I think that was, that's a good explanation. And with herbicide resistant crops in particular, they, they do fall into this gap between USDA and EPA. Mm -hmm. And USDA says, okay, we're just looking at a crop that has a certain gene in it. And the fact that the gene allows much greater herbicide use on the crop is irrelevant to USDA. You know, they don't even look at the function of the crop. It's just the gene. And they say, oh, all the rest is EPA's mm -hmm. responsibility. And EPA doesn't, you know, just regulates herbicides used on these crops as if they were any other herbicides. You know, they, they don't take special account of the herbicide resistant crop mm -hmm. kind of, you know, framework, which is responsible for all resistant weeds or these yeah. other problems. So, yeah. And I think one of the things we have no law that directly regulates yeah. genetically modified organisms. That was that tried to patch that to say that in the to, yeah. but not to regulate. Basically, made under under you know way on bush. We're still hampered by that very much. Mm -hmm. Are there other questions? Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the crop that we didn't see on the chart, which is wheat. And my understanding is that it was the farmers who rejected it. So I'm wondering mm -hmm. what happened, but I don't know anything more about it other than that. So I'm wondering if, if you could speak about what happened there, if there was a campaign, or why why did farmers reject GMO wheat, but 90% of soybeans are GMO? And the, the, what I have that. heard was that wheat is a, is a primary constituent in a lot of food products, bread. Right? For instance, with you know pasta and, and things like that, and um, there's much more resistance to, especially in foreign markets, to eating wheat that's been or bread that's been genetically engineered than there would be, say, in having a, 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 a high fructose corn syrup or some you know soy oil in a much more complex product, like some sort of toasty or a, a, a pot pie or something like that. 
that because it's the main constituent in the ingredient, um, there's a lot more resistance to it. Plus, I think a lot of the soy and corn goes to animal feed, which is very difficult to, to track. You can't test for that yet. And all, all people know that with the amount of soy and corn we grow, virtually all our animals are being fed on that, unless they're raised organically. You can't really prove it in the same sense that you can test it and show the constituent parts. That's what I heard. No, I think, yeah, I think you're right, Jack. It's, it's, meat is the staff of life. You know, it's our staple. Whereas corn and soy are, you know, mostly the fed animals who are used to make fuel. So it, in our consciousness, it's, it's what we eat. Whereas corn and soy are, you know, what are those? And just to add evidence to that, the, the, very briefly, there were genetically engineered potatoes introduced from 1999 to 2000. And then Burger King and McDonald's and Pringles actually just suddenly said, no, we don't want it anymore. They told the growers, we do not want genetically engineered potatoes because they were really worried about, not about their health, I don't think. Not only so they were worried about the blowback, the PR blowback. Again, potatoes, you know, that's just like wheat. It's something we identify with as a primary food. Yeah. There's no, practically, I think, you know, people who do, who raise organic animals, you know, they have to buy the organic life. The parent has to be organic. They say, you're buying a cow, but the cow's mother has to be organic. And so you're, you're going all the way down the chain. It's an expensive operation, and you, you're on a hook to do that. You, see, you get it out the other end, that there are consumers who are willing to pay more because it's, it's, it's organic. You know? So there's no real reason to switch. I don't think that you, you would find the same market. I would say it also depends on which gene crop is, is an issue and what, what the issues are with it. Each one is different. And so in some cases, uh, the, the issue is not transgenic DNA. That's usually not what's going to hurt you. It could be the alteration in the, the composition of the food through the genetic engineering process that can lead to effects. You could have higher levels of certain more toxic compounds. Um, and you know, so yeah, it, it really depends. But it seems like it's almost impossible in today's world to mm -hmm. have the way it's mm -hmm. Because they one way or another. Oh, well, there are, there are, we raise organic, on our farm, we raise organic meat, you know, chickens and bacon and cows, and you can do it. Yeah. It just, um, it's a small market and it's a personal market, and, you know, in the Northeast, there are people doing it because we have the affluence and the how you translate that to Iowa and the rest, I don't know. Well, I just wanted to make a comment about the wheat that I'm assuming that the genetically modified soy and corn is, is easy to hide in, in uh, ingredients. It's used as fillers, so it's much easier to put under the radar, whereas wheat is probably a main, would be like the number one ingredient. So I just wanted to add that. And then I wanted to ask, when did they reject the genetically engineered potatoes? Was that 1999? 2000, I think. Yeah, it was grown for maybe about a year. Is there anything I could find online about that? Yeah. I could, I could send you something on that. Yeah. It was rejected by Burger King and who else? McDonald's and I believe Pringles and you know, very big users of potatoes. And stuff. There was actually a time when the uh, Frito Lay came out against GM corn. But they uh, <coughs> changed their mind after a while, I guess, because they wasn't enough. They, they actually testified in Texas that they were not going to buy corn for their